Good morning um, and welcome to the 26th meeting in 2014 of the Health and Sport Committee. First of all, uh, can I intimate apologies for Richard Lyle um, and uh, Dennis Robertson, SMP sub, is here again with us today. Welcome, uh, Dennis. Um, I would ask everyone at this point um, to switch off mobile phones as, uh, as they have a risk of interfering with the proceedings, although um, I should also point out that uh, you will see some committee members and indeed um, those who support us uh, using uh, tablet devices instead of their hard papers. Um, firstly, um, the, the first item uh, on our agenda today is a decision on whether to take item three, um, which is our draft report on health inequalities in private. Uh, the committee agreed. Thank you. Then we uh, will proceed now to um, a normal format for, for uh, a roundtable session. Um, and uh, introduce myself as uh, Duncan McNeill, um, uh, uh, convener of the Health and Sport Committee. Um, Colin. Uh, I'm Colin Fraser. I'm a mental health officer from Glasgow City Council, and I'm here as a member of the MHO Forum for Glasgow Social Work. Uh, Bob Doris, MSP for Glasgow and Deputy Convener of the Health and Sport Committee. Um, Beth Hall, I'm part of the Health and Social Care team with the Convention of Scottish Local Authorities. And good morning. I'm Dennis Robertson, MSP for Aberdeenshire West and a substitute for the Health and Sport Committee. Good morning. I'm John Gillis. I'm chair of the Royal College of GPs in Scotland. Uh, good morning. I'm Gil Patterson. I'm the local member for Claybank Mogai. Good morning. I'm Ruth Stocks and I'm representing the British Psychological Society. Good morning. I'm Colin Keir. I represent Edinburgh Western Constituency. Uh, Aileen MacLeod, and uh, representing the South of Scotland. I'm John Crichton. I'm representing the Royal College of Psychiatrists. Uh, Richard Simpson, MSP Mid Scotland and Fife. And can I just clear my declaration, Chair, while I'm at it, as Fellow of the Royal Colleges of Psychiatry and of General Practice, and also Honorary Chair of Psychology at University of Stirling. Hi, I'm Derek Marn, Associate Nurse Director for Mental Health Services in NHS Ayrshire and Arm. I'm here as Chair of the Mental Health Nurse Forum Scotland. And Nanette Milne, MSP for North East Scotland. Good morning, I'm Karen Campbell, Principal Mental Health Officer, Highland Council, and I'm here as the Chair of Social Work Scotland and Mental Health. Rhoda Grant, Highlands and Islands, MSP. Thank you all for that. I should point out at this, uh, this stage, as in the committee members will know well the format that we we're here to listen to you and there'll be less questions well we need the first question from an MSP but uh, we'll get things going and um, remind the MSPs that the, the preference will always be to the panel member you know if, uh, through, through this process Richard uh, Simpson yes can I open up now just saying that one of the questions that uh, concerned us originally was the fact that uh, not all elements of the bill were being reviewed in the McManus Review, and I wonder if anyone has any particular comments about emissions from, from the bill um, as it now stands that you, you regard as being important. Dr. Kane. Uh, yeah, so there was a general feeling, particularly from my own faculty of forensic psychiatry, that there was a wee bit of an opportunity missed, and that it would have been uh, welcome to have had an opportunity to look more fundamentally at all the aspects of uh, the Act, including those uh, forensic aspects of the Act, which, because of various other pressures, have found their way into the bill without quite the same uh, route of uh, consultation and scrutiny. Any other comments? Dr. Stokes? Um, yes. The British Psychological Society has disappointed them that the bill doesn't go far enough. Um, in relation to the McManus report, um, it's felt that um, the comments about the care plan and the need for a more detailed care plan would help with the um, need for a shift in emphasis in mental health care away from what is a traditional medical model towards a far more biopsychosocial approach to the care of mental health. If there was a detailed care plan, this would direct practitioners to pay far more attention 
to the broad range of psychological and social therapies that are required in the treatment of mental health. Thank you. Any other comment? Richard? Around forensic, which, Chair, with your permission, I will perhaps uh, not go into it in detail today, but I think, I think uh, Dr Crichton is probably referring to the Noel Ruddle case, which in fact was the first one I was got involved in in the Parliament, which was the first bill passed by our Parliament in 1999, which was a gentleman who um, was let out from the state hospital, had a personality disorder, I think, and there was a, then a hurried, rushed bill, emergency legislation, which... Um, ensured that another five or six who were about to depart on the same basis were then contained, but it was then put into the 2003 Act. But with your permission, Chair, I'll come back to that maybe at a later stage. But uh, uh, the other issue I might raise for general discussion is the question of the extension of the short-term order uh, to for the additional time allowed for the tribunals to sit uh, as the convener will remember we had evidence the other week saying that the numbers involved in this where there was a stress was actually substantially reduced by improved administration. And I know that some of our um, um, people, at, uh, witnesses attending today for the round table have concerns uh, uh, on both sides about the extension of the time beyond the 28 days in which the tribunal can sit. So I wonder if people would like to make uh, comments on the record on that. Anyone? Go, uh, Mr. Fraser. It was uh, certainly the position of Glasgow City Council when this was discussed that they had concerns about the extension and uh, the idea of adding or, or deducting time at the other end. Um, it was almost like treating it like it was a prison sentence or, or something. At the, the, the point of being detained is for treatment. And, and we felt that there had been improvements and that there would be a risk that people would work to the wire and, and always go up to the last minute uh, without there being real purpose to it. Dr Stocks? It's important that um, detentions are as short as possible, um, that sometimes um, longer periods of time are required to complete assessments thoroughly. Um, certainly in the case of psychological assessments, sometimes this can't be done in short periods of time. Um, and therefore, occasionally, um, it's necessary to um, have the assessment done properly for the period to be extended. Anyone else? Dr Crichton. Uh, just an observation about how we're dealing with an uh, evolving pattern with the tribunals. And the tribunals are working much more efficiently, um, uh, particularly under the current president in the last few years, uh, than they were when they were starting off and finding their feet. And, uh, and therefore, when we're uh, looking at those uh, time limits, um, I think it's probably worthwhile to reflect on uh, where we're at now and not where we were at uh, some time ago, uh, in that um, uh, what a sensible uh, uh, time limit is, uh, is now uh, um, uh, may have changed even over the last couple of years. No one else want you to respond to that? That represents the, well, slightly differing. Come back very briefly on that and just say that at the moment it's 28 days and the proposal is, there's a five day extension, but the proposal is to make it, I think, 10 or 14 days. Um, and I just wonder whether, with the comments about the wire, which I think are pertinent, whether it, it would not would it be practical to shift the short-term detention order back to 24 days and then have the longer extension, which would mean that actually people would, the wire would come, you know, the, the, the total time wouldn't be any longer, but the, the wire would, be, as it were, be earlier, which would mean that in those cases where an assessment was possible at an early stage, uh, that it would actually happen. I just don't know if that's clinically practical or not. Can we have some response on that then? I think, Bob, you want to ask some questions on this as well. Yes, Dr. King. <coughs> Interesting proposal. I think in uh, many cases, a decision can be made um, in 24 days. Um, I think, though, that uh, Dr. Scott's uh, starts, uh, observation 
uh, about complex psychological treatments, I think even with the two-week extension may not be resolved in, uh, in many cases. So I don't think any of the time limits we're discussing today would particularly answer uh, 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 that point. But um, I think that uh, Dr. Simpson's uh, uh, proposal is one that uh, is worthy of further reflection. Dr. Stock. Um, I've got nothing to add to that. Thank you. you no response to the, the general point that. I think if um, if psychological assessments are requested early enough, then there should generally be enough time to do it. I think it is occasionally the case that sometimes. Um, a longer time might be required than is originally envisaged. However, the key point, um, and I do take Dr Crichton's point, that sometimes these um, assessments are lengthy um, regardless of when you start them, but the earlier that they can be instructed, the better. And again, that goes back to the initial point about if this was you know, much more of a priority in terms of people's care, then the consideration for a psychological assessment would be more in everyone's minds. Mm. I suppose it's a move into the, to, to the general rule that everyone could end up longer um, rather than addressing the, the, the initial point of uh, getting this done properly and, uh, and quickly, I suppose. Is that, uh, that's a nub of it, is it not? Mr Fraser, were you going to come in there and help me um, out? <laughs> no. No? Um, but I... I, 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 I I take on the, 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 the point from my uh, psychology colleague about the, the need for psychological assessment. Um, I was just a bit concerned with how the proposal was originally drafted. The, 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 the tone of it, that you compensate somehow by way, taking a wee bit off at the end, um, when in fact the point of it is, is, is for assessment yeah. and treatment rather than being some kind of balancing up in terms of the justice of it. I'm not sure that was the right way of thinking about it. And, and, I, and I do think that the natural tendency is for people to work to the wire. I think if you extend it, that, 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 I think that's almost inevitable that that will happen. Bob Doris. Yeah. Thanks, Gideon. I was just going to test some of the evidence we got, we got last week because we had uh, the Mental Health Tribunal for Scotland and the Mental Welfare Commission last week, and I asked specifically about why it was 28 days and could that, in theory, be reduced. And both witnesses had broad agreement that you're talking about getting between three to four weeks to get all the relevant reports ready and prepared to make an informed assessment and the number hadn't been plucked out a, a thin air. So on balance, I'd be interested in whether people think 28 days is about right. And just to follow up on some of the evidence we got from last week as well, um, the figure was given 70 to 80 per cent um, of all tribunals now uh, are made within that 28 day or five day extension period and wouldn't be, wouldn't be needed for that additional five days. And the argument was put to us, and I suppose this comes to the crux of it, there's always a balance with these, thing, these things. The argument was put to us that the main reason for the extension from five to ten days would be for those 20 to 30 per cent of cases that don't meet the current targets, that it would avoid or reduce repeat tribunals, and that it would give more time for relevant family members to make statements and representations as well. So there's obviously we're looking at whether there's a balance to be struck in relation to this about the you know the rights of the individual uh, un under these detentions or not. So twenty eight days there was agreement last week that that seemed to be about right. There seemed to be agreement last week that this wasn't for people to work to the wire, but it was to reduce multiple repeat tribunals and give family members more time to have a say. So that was the evidence we got last week. I'm just wondering whether the professionals here today concur with that or not, because we have to make a judgment call as a committee. Dr Crichton. I, I would broadly concur with that. I read the evidence um, from the Commission and the, uh, and the President of the Tribunals uh, to you. And um, w w we're talking broadly about similar time frames here. Um, and it's, it's very difficult to say what precisely is the correct um, uh, um, uh, time frame that we uh, should uh, look to when you know we're uh, talking one week or uh, uh, sort of either side. Um, so uh, we're trying to strike a reasonable balance. And in striking that reasonable balance, ultimately we need to suck it and see uh, and uh, review how we uh, go with that. Now clearly, 
there have been some issues, and those issues have um, uh, uh, come to their conclusion in the proposal that's before us in the bill. Uh, the only observation I would make is that um, I, I wonder whether some of those um, uh, conclusions have been borne out by experience when uh, the tribunals were settling in and not working as efficiently as they are at the minute. But I wouldn't, you, you know, if the tribunal is coming back to us and the commission are coming back to us and saying that particular groups are being disadvantaged in the current time frames, then I, I don't think um, there would be strong views from uh, the professionals about one, one week, one side or another. Dr. Stocks. Um, sorry, can I just say again that um, we would be concerned that um, if there was a deadline which um, a responsible um, a, an RMO felt couldn't be met if a more specialist assessment such as a psychological assessment was instructed, that it then wouldn't be instructed because of the fear that the deadline would be missed. Um, I, I appreciate there is a difficulty in deciding exactly how long that period of time should be. However, my concern is that um, if there is already some pressure felt, and this is when psychological reports are not routinely instructed, then perhaps this is making it less likely that we will be in future. Okay, no, no other response. Yeah, Mr. Barton. Can you just say, sir, I should have said I'm here on behalf of the Royal College of Nursing as well, just for the record. Um, I asked some of my colleagues across uh, Scotland to relate to this from a nursing perspective, and they weren't convinced that the extension from the five days um, would actually make a significant difference, on the basis that a lot of the extensions are because solicitors are asking for um, a second opinion, so it's about, about that point. But they did absolutely acknowledge <coughs> what Bob Dora said, that it may actually allow the named person or relatives to gather more information, so there was a on balance, they weren't convinced, mm -hmm. but recognised the argument of better access. I suppose uh, we'll need to see if, you know, I mean, it's, uh, I think it's an area where, which will need to be examined thoroughly in the, in the future to see if it has made any, any difference. There seems to be some some questions about whether it will address the issue. Can we, can we move... Yes, certainly. A very, just as it occurs to me, um, would there be a benefit in putting into the legislation a time limit, say five days, that the the patient was informed of the tribunal so that they had the extra five days to pull together second opinions and reports? So you're not shortening the time for the tribunal, you're actually extending the time for the patient rather than go to a tribunal and then get an extension to come back to a tribunal. Is, is there any merit in kind of changing the length of time and seeing, you know, what proportion is available to, to whom? Does that make sense? And it's, I'm not, you're not understanding what I'm saying? I'm looking at blank faces. <laughs> I, I suppose what I'm saying is that rather than um, a patient going to a tribunal and asking for an extension because they need extra time to pull together the reports they require to represent themselves properly, that they be allowed to do that sooner so that the tribunal needs to present them with the paperwork within the five days as currently happens, but that they can then ask for the tribunal to, rather than go to a tribunal and ask for an extension, that they can ask for that extension to pull back their papers without having to go to two tribunals. May, may have been a, <clears throat> may have been a better question for last week and those who run the tribunals, you know, I suppose. Um, there is an attempt here to reduce, you know, repeat appearances and all the stress that that, that involves. The question is, instinctively, we feel that, you know, in life experience, if you, if you, <laughs> if you extend the time, you don't actually change that problem at all. If you work within those, 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 those limits, there's no pressure, if you like, to increase the 70% who are going through uh, successfully at this point to 80% or 90%. Of course that will go up because the time limit, the, the time frame that they're working in will, will go up. So that start will look pretty good, but um, you know, what, what are the consequences of that for the individual uh, who, who's caught up in this procedure? And Dr. Crichton. I think that um, uh, there are issues of 
access to appropriate specialists to give independent reports for patients who are seeking them. But often folk will know very early on in terms of a 28-day um, uh, admission that uh, longer detention powers are, are being under consideration and the ball can be uh, 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 started rolling. Uh, I think um, perhaps the conversation has been about the provision of timely reports. But actually, the length of time is also about response to treatment and observing the person in a specialist environment to try and get clarity about diagnosis and um, um, the other questions we have to address in terms of compulsory measures. And, uh, and I think that's worth thinking about as well, that sometimes uh, the time limits we have uh, don't allow us uh, as much time in every case to uh, do that sort of assessment to see whether uh, longer detention is the, is the uh, correct way forward. Uh, and that's particularly the case in Section 52 remands, which we may come on to later. Yeah. Dr. Stocks. Um, just to say that, um, given that this is obviously a difficult decision, um, a number of people have mentioned that um, it would be interesting to know who the group that are not meeting the 28 days consists of um, and whether there's any pattern to that. If, um, I think it was um, Mr Barron suggested that um, it's often because a second opinion is being requested, then those are generally the more complex cases. And it may be that it is a subset of people who actually do require additional specialist assessments, um, a more thorough look at their situation that need this additional time. Um, and that the vast majority of cases can be dealt with um, in the shorter time period. It may be worthwhile <clears throat> um, you know, examining whether there, there is some detail around those uh, for, for, for the committee about those groups or individuals that, 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 that this particularly applies to. So we could maybe check that out and ask for some more information. But certainly one of the issues that uh, was related to this was, the, um, I think, in the discussions and the evidence last week, was the role of the mental health officer and, and uh, capacity there, and indeed the importance of that role uh, within the, this, uh, the, the, this system. Does any, anyone want to uh, speak to that or comment on that? No? Uh, yep. Uh, yep. Colin Fraser. Um, I think I would uh, seek to associate myself with uh, the statements made in the Mental Welfare Commission's written response to, to the committee. I, I think there are quite serious implications for MHO resourcing, um, and I think what's been proposed does involve some significant extra work for mental health officers that, that certainly was a concern to us in the forum and, and when it was discussed um, in, in a group at Glasgow City level. Um, in particular, um, the proposals that, that a named person um, has to sign up uh, to be a named person. And uh, uh, I'm not clear if there's been any further developments in thinking about who the prescribed person would be. Uh, I think our assumption is that will fall to MHOs in large part. Quite often we have named persons who live in different cities. Um, Quite often, our out-of-hours standby service may give consent to detention at uh, 2 o'clock in the morning or something like that, and there's no way you're going to access a named person in those circumstances. Um, the idea that we uh, may have to actually... It, it will certainly involve an extra visit. And I would have thought that in terms of the, the, the concern I have that uh, at a national level... Um, we're having problems retaining MHOs. The numbers are going down, and it's an ageing population we've got nationally of MHOs. Um, in, in Glasgow, um, we had 120 MHOs in 2011. We've got 94 <coughs> in 2013. This is at a point when their workload is dramatically increased, particularly in relation to adults with incapacity requirements. Mm -hmm. um, the the number of adults in capacity applications in relation to the older population has been increasing steadily over the past few years. It has increased dramatically in relation to people with learning disabilities. 
Some of that's to do with uh, the, the self-directed support agenda, and if not an unanticipated, I think the, the, the impact of that's been underestimated, possibly. So at a point when, if anything, our MHO workforce is in a slight decline, we're already having significant increases in our workload. And, and I think we need to be very careful with some of the proposals in this bill, because there's no doubt it's going to add significantly to workload. I would also wonder if the proposal that the requirement that MHO produce a, a report at review stage, whether it be scope for instead of that being a report, that the, the forms are amended, so instead of just being a signature, there's a statement of the MHO's opinion put in at that stage. That would go some way to addressing, I think, some of the concerns that you may have without requiring the significant extra work that would be involved in, in producing a separate report. So as, as, a, as a number of concerns, I would have that, that, that there's, I think, quite significant workload implications in what's being proposed for MHOs. Beth Hall, please. Um, I think maybe just to echo some of what Colin has said in terms of the, the work that we've done with our members around existing pressures on MHOs, um, in terms of the shrinking work, workforce that Colin's already mentioned, but I think also looking forward, these are only projected to continue to rise in terms of the adults with incapacity, um, in terms of the existing duties there, for example, around guardianships. Um, I think there's, there's some information being published that shows it's been increasing in around 10 to 12 per cent per annum since, since it was introduced. So we can see there's a trajectory there against the decline in, in the workforce that Colin mentioned. But I think also um, just last week the Scottish Law Commission published a report which I believe is proposing a new scheme around the restriction of liberty which would place additional pressures again on, on MHOs. So I think against that backdrop, um, looking at the bill that would introduce additional duties on MHOs, um, we would, we would concur with the, the Mental Welfare Commission's call for um, a national strategy on, on MHO um, workload and, and capacity on recruitment and retention, but um, I think we would want to see that go, to see that go further um, and also look at projected future demand, what that means for the capacity requirements and also how that would be resourced um, going forward. Um, I think in terms to some of the, the specific proposals within, within, the, bill, uh, within the bill, um, we had other concerns where we weren't able to reconcile what was being said in, in the bill explanatory notes with the financial memorandum. So it, it looked as though the financial memorandum estimates were based on a narrower interpretation um, of the duties than were, were actually appearing in the bill. Um, and I think uh, the Mental Health Tribunal for Scotland also picked up on that. Um, I think they were, they were very clear, they shared the view that actually MHO reports would be triggered in far more circumstances than the financial memorandum anticipates. Um, I mean, we can, if, if we can come on later, I could give a bit more detail around that in terms of, of what we think the likely requirement would be. Um, but certainly overall, we would be wanting to, to think um, very carefully about any new, new duties within, within that context until a sort of proper review is undertaken. Thank you. I'll get Mr Barron and then Dr Crichton. Not my area of expertise, so I asked some of my colleagues in North Ayrshire Council. Uh, I'm the lead nurse there as well. So, and they concur with exactly what Colin Baith have said about the workload issue and then the resourcing issue as it's going up. And so to put it into the bill would uh, cause great difficulty just in terms of workload. I suppose for us, uh, you know, in terms of the workload, would it you would it cause great difficulty in terms of implementing the 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 the, the, the bill uh, as it as it's uh, as it's intended? I suppose is the, the question for the committee. I mean, change is always. Um, I'm, I'm not uh, um, intending to dismiss or you know reduce the, the the anxiety we've heard here, but in most cases, if change, change is proposed, there is you know people will will be worried about that. But in terms of the bill and implementation and the objectives of the bill, you know, we'd still be able to go ahead with the bill. Beth Hall. I mean, I think I think the difficulty. Want to come back in on that one. Sorry. Yeah. I mean, I think the the difficulty is that 
Um, within the financial memorandum, it gives some estimates of the number of additional reports that would be required by measures within the bill, um, specifically section two of the bill, which relates to section 101 hearings. Um, the financial memorandum estimates that as requiring an additional 20 um, reports per annum. But if you look at what the financial memorandum actually bases that on, um, it's different circumstances, it's narrower circumstances than are actually contained within the bill itself. And I think both the Mental Welfare Commission and the Mental Health Tribunal for Scotland have pick also picked up on the same discrepancy. So looking at what it actually says in the bill um, around just Section 101 um, reports and taking Mental Health mm -hmm. Tribunal for Scotland figures, it wouldn't be 20 additional reports, it would be 493 Around, around 500, and there's the same issue with section 41 of the bill, discrepancy with the financial memorandum. So it's, it's a significant difference, and I think it's significant enough that it, it, it would be a big problem. Yes. Dr Crichton. Yes, uh, I'm sorry. I'll come to you. Uh, we would, of course, welcome uh, the input from mental health officers in a wider range of circumstances, but we had some real concerns that that might cause delays uh, in various different areas regarding appropriate treatment. Uh, for example, transfer for treatment directions, where uh, we have uh, some national prisons where the MHO will be called upon from various parts in the country to provide reports, sometimes in urgent circumstances. Um, as, a, as a general comment, and I, I wouldn't take away at all from the, the comments from our uh, social work experts uh, in the room, it, also, it has struck me as a, a curious thing that for psychiatrists, the approved medical practitioner training is um, uh, really quite modest, and an online module and a, and a day's course, and that compares um, uh, rather starkly with the very comprehensive training of mental health officers. And I just wonder whether we've got the balance there right, and also the balance of expectation in terms of mental health um, social workers generally all being expected to uh, be mental health officers as we would expect all psychiatrists to be um, uh, approved medical practitioners. Thanks. Carmen Campbell. Yeah, I would just um, concur with what's being said about the extra um, duties on MHOs and from the social work um, Scotland mental health um, subgroup, we, we've also raised the, the concerns about the additional work placed on MHOs, and it is significant. Um, I think it's important to look at why those reports are being required, and I think it, you know that they, they are seen to be, um, you know, that's going to be best practice, and I think it's important not to dismiss that. Um, and we, we need to remember what, what the Act is about. And I think, although we require to, to do more work, we need to look at how we're going to be able to do that and how, what support we need to be able to do that rather than not do it. Um, because I think the, 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 the bill, as it's been presented, is, is specifically to support people who are mentally unwell and have mental disorders and are needing this, this, uh, the, the legislation for their protection and, and uh, well-being. I think when it comes to um, the um, training for MHOs, I think that's another issue which you know you, you mentioned there, and I think it's it's important to look at this very comprehensive training, and it's for you know a workforce that is ageing, and you know how do we make MHO training attractive to people? And currently, uh, there, there, you know we haven't we have. A lot of mental health officers in Scotland that are in the next 10 years aren't going to be around, they're going to retire. So we need to focus on how do we um, you know, encourage people to undertake the training and become MHOs. Bob? Yeah. Thanks, Camina. Um, uh, I think Karen Campbell's kind of hit the nail on the head here. First of all, I'd like to say, of course, the committee will explore the the numbers that were outlined, whether it's 20 reports or 493 reports and the pressures in the workforce planning and recruitment and retention, of course, as a matter of course, we'll be asking those questions to the relevant people within government and elsewhere. So, but actually, the bigger picture is, are these reports required? 
Are they essential? Are they highly desirable? Are they just a, a slight advance in the way things are just now? What I've not really heard from people is how desirable these reports would be, because I'd like to make a judgment on whether it's the right thing to do, and then I'd like to make a judgment on how we resource and enable that to happen. And I feel the discussion we've had so far has been around whether we can resource and enable that to happen. And we'll, we will look at those figures as a committee, and, and we'll make a, we'll make a you know a well-rounded uh, decision on that, I'm sure, in due course. But we've not heard enough, apart from Ms Campbell, really about whether it's desirable or not. So I'd, for myself, I'd, I'd like some information about how desirable or otherwise that is. Dr Creighton. I, I, think, I think we would say that they were highly desirable, um, uh, but uh, we're responding from uh, our real world experience of how sometimes we can have difficulties even now. And we would certainly need to have some urgent measures whereby in those circumstances where we couldn't achieve uh, the report, that we could still achieve the um, urgent treatment uh, uh, required, uh, for example, in transfer for treatment directions. Dr. Stokes. Um, I think in the code of practice, mental health officers are, um, are it's recommended that they seek advice um, from other practitioners who might be involved in a person's care. Um, and to that extent, um, we would feel that the reports are highly desirable. Um, they're desirable anyway, but I think it is often the case that um, that wider input um, doesn't happen, possibly because of the resourcing issue. Um, so we would feel that it's extremely important to continue having the reports, but actually there needs to be contribution from other professionals into those reports. Okay. Dennis yeah. Robertson. Yeah, uh, thank you, Convener. Just on that point, I, I'm wondering basically the role of the general practitioner um, uh, w within this, because uh, I would think that the pathway for a lot of patients uh, in the initial stages is through general practitioners. I'm just wondering the pressure on the general practitioners themselves from making that initial judgment um, to refer patients on for the, that, that specialist pathway of treatment. I think that's your cue, Dr. Gillis. Thank you. Am I, am I audible? Yes. Yes, sir. <laughs> yeah. You're not lighting up, though. I don't know. Yeah. Thank you for raising the, the point, Dennis. These, uh, these events in, uh, in general practice occur, uh, they're not rare, but they are unusual, and they're not part of the day-to-day -day work. When they do happen, they're often complex and require a lot of time and attention and can often be disruptive to the more routine parts of a, of, of a GP's day. Um, so, and the, GPs do not take the decision to refer on a, for, to, for a psychiatric opinion and for a mental health officer's opinion lightly. My, my understanding and my, my experience is that when they do happen, <clears throat> they're dealt with by GPs in a reasonably timid manner, I, I, as far as I can understand from the bill, I don't see <clears throat> a, a large implication for increased workload for GPs from this, as far as I can see, and that the onus falls largely on mental health officers rather than on the general <clears throat> practitioner. There are one or two points about general practice I would raise later on, but does that address your concerns? I, I, think, I think what <clears throat> I'm really trying to get at is, is, is GPs are the under... Uh, significant pressure to make these uh, initial judgment calls uh, and uh, as you say general practitioner is sort of general practice and they don't have the sort of generic well they've got generic uh, mm -hmm. uh, knowledge but rather rather than a specialist knowledge mm -hmm. and I'm just wondering are there enough specialists within practices uh, uh, in, in various parts uh, where there's maybe a, a high incidence of, mm -hmm. of people requiring maybe a, a referrals on um, is that covered adequately within general practice and, and, and medical centres? Mm. And you call on your colleagues, basically. Thank you. I think the, the, the point of view of the general practitioner is that of an, uh, an expert clinical generalist. So that means an understanding of both the kind of biomedical aspects of care, and that means both uh, 
um, physical illness and mental health or psychiatric illness, but we also have a knowledge of what we would describe as the biographical aspects of care, which is an understanding <coughs> of that person within the context of her family, her community, her, her culture uh, and ethnicity. Um, and th that is the, these are the core skills of general practice and it's on these skills that we would draw to make a decision. So obviously we, we specialists and generalists, which we are, work closely together. Specialists need generalists and generalists need specialists. So I, I would suggest the right starting point is still the general practitioner and then she or he can make a decision about involvement. As far as I know, that system has worked reasonably well. I'm grateful for any a discussion from specialist or psychological colleagues <coughs> on that. Dr. Crichton. Um, support those comments. I think uh, we were talking about why 28 days, and this has been a tried and tested time frame. Another tried and tested observation is that uh, the, the combination of specialist and general practitioner in decisions about compulsory treatment is something that historically ha has worked very well. And colleagues who are regularly um, making these decisions with their general practice colleagues give very positive feedback about uh, that input, particularly that uh, broader appreciation of, of families and communities that general practitioners bring to these decisions. It's actually in those areas where somebody isn't registered with a general practitioner that we have difficulties and we usually have to uh, scratch around to find uh, an AMP from an independent area to come and assist us in uh, second uh, medical recommendations. Uh, I've often thought in those circumstances it would be nicer to try and get a, an independent GP from some place. But, of course, GPs are under tremendous pressure, and we're very grateful to all the contribution they, they do bring to these uh, decisions. Anybody? Yes, Dr. Stokes. The, that more holistic view of individuals is being very important in decisions about their management. Um, I would just reiterate my point that um, there are times where specialist input is also required, um, there are a number of ways to do that, um, and psychologists are one of the range of professionals who might be contributing, and perhaps more often those, uh, the views of those people could be taken into account. Dr Gillis. Thank you. Uh, not to prolong the discussion too, too much, uh, convener, but uh, we, we're certainly on record at RCGP in supporting an increased provision of psychological services for people with mental health disorders. Um, there is some evidence that the biomedical model of uh, dealing with mental health, which has been the predominant one for the last 30 years, has had great strengths and great successes, but um, the paradigm is now changing, and I think we are often frustrated in general practice by uh, an inability to access uh, timiously um, psychological support. There certainly have been improvements in that area in recent years, uh, but there is still some way to go on this. We, Beth, did you want to say anything more on that? Um, and section 14 of the bill makes a provision for certain nurses to detain, as you know, we have touched on a lot of areas here. Do anyone, does anyone um, want to speak on that in terms of certain nurses' power to retain, which the Mental Welfare Commission are, 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 are concerned about? Yeah, Mr. Barn. As I said the last time I was at the committee, we are concerned about that and see, don't see that as a proper extension of the nurse's role. Um, the nurse, to be able to do that, has to diagnose, and nurses don't diagnose. And an element of nurses being able to prescribe, and we've got very few nurses that can prescribe, we have some. So it's not something that we support at all in terms of nurses to be able to detain in those circumstances. The only sort of detention we would say for a nurse is in section 299, which is part of consideration, which I presume we're coming to as well. Okay. Dr Stocks and then Dr Crichton. Yes, certainly. 
extremely pleased to hear um, that um, there is a recognition of the need for this shift in emphasis from the traditional medical model towards a more biopsychosocial approach. Um, can I just say that we're not, um, as a, a psychologist, presenting anything that is a challenge to what other people do. It's about seeing mental health care as requiring a number of components um, with various interventions, but that in addition to the more traditional forms of treatment, um, such as medicine um, and mental state monitoring, that a range of psychological and social therapies are required. Um, and it seems that to me that um, actually this shift, although it may be recognised by um, the clinical professions, also needs to, needs to be um, made aware um, amongst the general public and users and carers of services. Um, and we would recommend that the language of mental health legislation is changed. Um, currently, um, there is reference to medical treatment which, um, although listed under that, are a range of um, different types of intervention, including psychological interventions. Um, in practice, those are not given the due recognition. Um, and it seems to me that by, um, only by um, more fundamental changes in the legislation will there be um, a more progressive approach to mental health care which I think was envisaged um, in the existing legislation, but that has not been realised in practice, or certainly not to the extent that um, users of services require. Thank you. Carmen Campbell, please. Uh, the Social Work um, Mental Health Subgroup, we felt that this was, the, the, to extend it to three hours, nursing, nurses holding power to extend that three hours was actually something we viewed positively because it would enable um, the nurse to, you know, contact both the MHO and the RMO. And I think there are in a number of local authorities in Scotland where hospitals are not necessarily right where the MHO happen, happens to be. So it allowed that, that extra bit of time. And... Um, as a result, the people would be more likely to be detained on an STDC rather than an EDC, uh, which would be, be better practice for them. See, Mr. Bam wants back in on that. Right. One. Last year, 2013 14, there were 177 uses of the nurses' power to detain. Only 74% of them went on to actually have a detention. Um, of that, 40% uh, were emergency and 34 were short-term detention, and another 23% actually stayed on in the hospital without use of detention. The Code of Practice has currently uh, sent out by the Mental Welfare Commission earlier this year in terms of the step of process as the nurse tells the individual, I'm going to use uh, Section 299 of the nurse's holding powers, and they've got a form to fill out, and they inform the doctor. The doctor has to be there within two hours. Only once the doctor has said, yes, I'm going to do that, do they call the MHO? To actually impact on the three hours, you'd have to call the MHO at the beginning of the process. So if you called the MHO at the beginning of the process, bearing in mind the workload issue we've already heard from the MHOs, in 44 cases, you'd have called the MHO for no fact, sorry, so 70 cases you'd have called the MHOs for no purpose whatsoever, because the person either decided to stay in hospital or were not then detained. So we're using our MHO resource going from somewhere remote to a hospital for no purpose whatsoever. So there's no advantage of that. My other issue is about reciprocity for the individual. We are placing on them and saying, we're not going to allow you to leave for two hours. I think that places on us in service equal response that we must do as soon as. So there are, there's no evidence to say that the extension of two to three hours would have any impact whatsoever. Ayrshire and Arran, we only used nurses' power to detain nine times last year. Even in Greater Glasgow and Clyde, only used it 27 times in the entire year. So I'm not sure why the push of where that, and I've got the stats, which will come out from the Commission um, later this week, I think, to say there is no evidence that there's going to be an advantage to this, nor is there any evidence that increasing the, the length of time is going to have impact whatsoever, other than the person who our duty is to protect their human rights not to make it easier for our workload. 
just going with the, the, the panel, but I, I've got a couple of bids from Dr. Crichton. I think that the um, one of the possible areas where this may be coming from is concerns from rural and remote, but I wonder whether there are other solutions that can be looked into. We are expanding our use of video technology and uh, that type of assessment where there can be um, uh, telemedicine from uh, um, a practitioner's home computer into the clinical workspace with appropriate safeguards and security. So I, I, I just wonder whether there may be um, um, other ways to crack uh, this particular nut. Bob, Doris. Yeah, sorry, I'm just, I'm just trying to clarify a, a couple of things. Mr. Barn, I have no idea if, if this extension is the right thing to do or not. That's kind of why I have, I have no preconceived views on this. But just for clarity, I wasn't sure whether you were saying we shouldn't extend it because the Mental Welfare Commission said we probably shouldn't extend it because they don't think that it will lead to any greater involvement from the RMOs rather than the fact that it was necessarily a bad thing to extend in itself, that it wouldn't have the intended consequence. But just in your evidence, are you suggesting, I might just have picked you up wrong, are you suggesting that the current power to detain shouldn't exist? Because I was getting a sentiment that you were saying that maybe it's not, not a positive thing in the first place. And just some clarity around that. And secondly, just in terms of the views of, of nurses, um, is... It's only some nurses, isn't it? So it's uh, mental health nurses and it's learning disability nurses that can do that. Have, have they themselves raised concerns specifically? So have they across Scotland taken a view on this and raised concerns specifically about the current two-hour detention? Because if they had done that, something this committee would obviously want to know about. The first part of that question, is it a positive thing? Yes, it's a positive thing. Um, it's not used as well as we would like, and when the Commission published their guidance, their updated guidance earlier this year, and we're going to do additional training, we would like far more nurses to use the power to detain, because with it brings the protection of the Act to the individual. So we probably feel there are some detentions, de facto detentions, going in without the provision of the Act, which I think is unfair on the individual. So that's the first part of that. There is no concern from um, mental health nurse leaders across Scotland in relation to the two hours. Our concern is extending it further. Okay. We don't see any need to do that, and I don't think that's within the ethos of the Act or our approach to human rights, because we don't see it will give any advantage whatsoever, and yet you're placing a restriction that you maybe don't need to. Right. OK, I'll, I'll, I'll digest that. I'm, I'm generally not trying to be awkward. I wasn't clear what the point you you were making was, I suppose the only other thing I would ask is you gave a, initially what, in 74% of the cases or something, did an initial when the RMO got there was there any additional detention given? And quite often that was a short term one, but it was given. I suppose the question I would ask is what would happen if the nurse didn't have that power to detain and then in the medium term the, the, the minority of cases where that detention would have been required for the, the, the safety of that individual, what would the consequence of that be? Again, I'm trying to get behind this. I totally accept the, the more power of detention you give, the more you infringe the, the rights and freedoms of individuals within society, but that has to be commensurate and balanced because you're also seeking to protect vulnerable individuals at the same time. So is there any benefit at all from extending from two uh, to three hours. I'm just trying to tease that out. My personal view and that of my colleagues across nursing, uh, associate nurse directors and mental health, etc., uh, there is no advantage of extending it. We don't see any advantage mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Okay. And so it, it may be a workload related to some area. We don't even know where it came from because it certainly didn't come from nursing to suggest that we should do this. In actual fact, we would prefer going back and doing more work with our nursing workforce in terms of using the, the actual powers to detain. I suppose it's okay just to just yeah, very briefly, yeah. and, and I there's, there's no reason for asking this other than I, I'm just interested to know that when you talk about taking the views of senior nurses about what the views are across Scotland, has the RCN done a, a kind of 
a deep survey of those on the those nurses on the coal face and learning disability and in mental health. So those on the ward and, and mental health units, for example, and those day to day hands on at the coal face with learning disabilities. Is this a kind of grassroots view or is that a kind of senior clinician view that you're bringing? Possibly it's both and that, that's fine. But it's just so I can get a flavour of where the view is coming from. It, it's both um, because we obviously engage with our staff. Right, so I certainly from my area, we've got a mental health nursing advisory committee, which has got mental health and learning disability nurses on it. So whether that's a brand new staff nurse in a ward or a community team or somebody more experienced, they're on that. So we get the feelings from them as well. But I certainly speak on behalf of senior staff who are the ones who are responsible to monitor and accountable for it. Um, we don't see any advantage and not one single nurse has come to me and said, do you know if we'd had a three hour period, things would have been better. That, that's really helpful. Thank you. Thanks for that. Any addition, Dr. Miller? Yeah, but uh, another part of the Act, if we want to yes, move certainly. on. Yes, Thank you. Um, it's on sections 21 and 22 advanced statements where uh, the, the bill seeks to place a duty on health boards to ensure that a copy of an individual's advanced statement is placed in the medical records and a copy is sent to the Mental Welfare Commission. And uh, th this seems like sensible practice. Uh, we, we, we uh, health boards have, and presumably hospitals have their own records. General practice has separate records, and it was and good practice would obviously be that this advanced statement is shared with the patient's GP as well as with uh, the hospital record. Uh, we know from from practice just uh, that that doesn't always happen. Um, and I wondered if there could be some way of ensuring that <coughs> the duty was not was for health boards to ensure that both GPs and specialists uh, and other clinicians who had uh, an input into a patient's care were, were made aware of the advanced statement. I mean, frequently the advanced statement comes through the general practitioner, but that's not always the case. It was just to make sure that everyone is kept informed because these are very significant statements when they're made and they must be carefully um, looked at in the, in the context of, say, a recurrence of a serious yeah. mental illness. Dr Crane. I think one place where the advanced statement should reside is the emergency care summary. And as that uh, rolls out and becomes more available to emergency mental health services, um, uh, I think that... Um, there'll be greater awareness of its use within mental health. Um, but I think it's essentially a matter for uh, the code of practice and uh, professional development into, uh, rather than a statute. Uh, yeah, yes, I, 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 would, I would agree with that. It was just to raise it as, a, as, a, as an important <coughs> issue. I th the emergency care summary has been hugely useful but it includes just very basic data about drugs and um, a, uh, allergies and intolerances. <coughs> the key information summary, which is currently being rolled out electronically across Scotland, might be the best place for this to sit. And if it sat there, it would, it would have the explicit consent of the patient <coughs> involved. So that, I would agree that would be the way forward. Thank you. Mr Barn. I was actually going to suggest a key information summary. Um, and I think we should pursue that. There will be technical difficulties in how we actually do it, but that shouldn't preclude us from trying to do it. But not everyone can access either the emergency care summary or the key information summary. The ESC is only currently available, the emergency care summary sorry, is only available for out of hours practitioners, uh, so it's not broadly across mental health. And it's not currently available in our wards, which is kind of where you need to have access to it. And neither is the key information summary. So I'm not saying we shouldn't do that, because I think you're right. And it's one central place to do it. I think we might have technical difficulties in how we do it. So when we introduce it, we need to be cognizant of that. Any, anyone else wish to make comment on that? Yes, I, I think it's really important. Uh, the point that Dr. Gillis makes is, uh, I think, is, is actually essential because uh, patients, in terms of their follow-up care, you know, will probably sit with the general practitioner in, in a lot of cases, uh, and not just for that patient, but maybe for the the, 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 the patient's um, extended family or carers as well. Um, and you know, I 
I take his point that it doesn't always happen, and I'm just wondering, to some extent, how often doesn't doesn't it happen? Because you know, I am aware of issues that where it hasn't. You know, it has it has unfortunately um, meant that a patient doesn't have the required follow up care, uh, and the GP is actually um, uh, very uh, well. He's just basically in the dark um, of of maybe the treatment or recommendations. Uh, either from um, uh, psychiatry or psychological services. So I think it is something, and, and I think uh, Dr Crichton's right, that it should be in the code of practice, but it needs to be something that actually is acted on. It, it can't just sit there and be nice words. It's something that, that actually is, is to the, the benefit of the patient. Uh, and I think we need to ensure that uh, it's something that is actually followed up. Dr Stocks. fact that often service users change their minds um, and that although um, <clears throat> we recognise that there might be a benefit in having a central register, that there also needs to be some way of ensuring that the um, advanced statement is kept up to date. Right. Um, and I think another point to make is that um, there is not always a good understanding amongst um, staff working with service users about how to create an advanced statement um, and um, I think it's, it would be useful to have some guidance in the Code of Practice. However, um, as we've learned um, from um, previous experience, the Code of Practice is not always, um, not enough attention is always paid to the Code of Practice. I mean, it may be that some training is required for staff working in mental health services across the board um, in how advanced statements can be created and kept up to date. Is there a role for advocacy in all of this in terms of making people aware that they can and possibly should have these advanced statements to you know to, to influence you know difficult circumstances or you know how common it, it, is it for a patient to have that advanced statement and, and that information anywhere? Colin Fraser and then Derek Barn. My, my experience is is that they're actually relatively rare. Um, I think it's, 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 it's been an aspect of the legislation that really didn't take off as much as people had hoped and anticipated. Um, and it's, it's always a bit of a treat when you actually do come across an advanced statement, but we, we're often asked at tribunals if it's an advanced statement, and the answer is more often than not no. So I think it is an area of, of work that perhaps merits revisiting in terms of guidance training. And I would agree with uh, Dr Stokes' comment that the, for the advanced statements that do exist, people do change their minds. And if there's a mechanism for recording it, there needs to be a mechanism for reviewing it and making sure the information's up to date. I think the answer to your question is the role for advocates, yes, there is. But there's a, a much greater role, for example, for community nurses who are engaged with uh, people when they're at a, a less ill stage. Because the advanced statement is about when I become ill, this is what I want to happen. So we need to be careful that the practitioner's not the one who's generating this. And I agree with Colin, they're, they're rare. And some of them are not very good in terms of just saying things that are just not doable. And a good advanced statement, because one of the suggestions from, it was actually the Social Work Mental Health subgroup, said about a pro forma. I think a pro forma, we've asked the Commission a mental welfare commission to think about doing a pro forma so we can have that but we have a lot of people who choose not to have advanced statements and we have to be cognizant of that as well that they and i have a, a huge concern about us having a central repository for it um the nhs in general have not got a fabulous um track record of having massive centralised systems at work and we can access it in terms of who's allowed to access it and when they can access it and unless it's available 24-7 it's pointless because you need to be able to access it when the person is becoming unwell or is going to be admitted you want an advanced statement say so what is it what's your desire what is it you want us to do in relation to that not all boards across Scotland have electronic systems that could do that and then where would the central point to go and get all these be and then as Dr Stock says if you change your mind how do you make sure it's updated on a, on a regular basis from the minute you change your mind to do things so it's just I, I, I suppose we don't need to worry about any of that because it's a we don't need to worry about any of that because it's a rare occurrence if, any, if, if, if a, a patient presents with one of these advanced statements 
despite the fact that we all agree that they at least could be helpful to that person. So maybe we need to turn it upside down a wee bit. I mean, these problems will present, but if we recognise that it's a good thing, if somebody wants to opt into that, we should maybe help make it happen and overcome some of these difficulties. We can do it in Ayrshire and Arm because we have an electronic health record uh -huh. for mental health. So all of our advanced statements are available 24 cents. In fact, I could access one, obviously I wouldn't, right here just now. So, but you have to have that ability to do that. But again, you're, you're right. We spend a lot of time doing that for something that people are not opting into doing. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr Gillis and then uh, Dr Stokes. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a really interesting discussion. I agree with Colin Fraser that advanced statements are really pretty rare and I, I was hoping that we would see many more of them actually when they became available because when, when, I, when, I have, uh, when they have been available with a patient they've often been hugely helpful actually for, for guiding professionals on how to deal with the, with the patient. On Derek Barron's point about the Mental Welfare Commission, I assumed that they, <coughs> they weren't the Mental Welfare Commission were, were sent a copy so that they were aware of um, the data and statistics around advanced statements rather than f for them to be used in the day-to-day -day care of the patient. And I still think it would, uh, it would be useful to have some hard data on advanced statements. And I would agree that it would be really useful to encourage them. I would be concerned about advanced statements going into the electronic care summary because that will become more widely available over time. I think that's the point of it. But I think often uh, patients would be rather concerned if uh, an advanced statement were made available in that way. And I think the place for them would be a key information summary, which should, to, to answer Dr Stock's point, be regularly updated in conjunction with the patient. Dr Stocks, then um, Dr Crichton. I note um, that in previous evidence given to this committee, um, someone from one of the third sector organisations spoke about how their research showed that people, service users, were not producing advanced statements because they believed that they would not be paid attention to and that there seemed no point in doing that. And it seems to me that that's very worrying um, and worrying for us as a society um, and that... Um, with any opportunity to influence the legislation, we need to make sure that it is promoting collaborative care for people who suffer from mental health problems and that we're doing everything we can to make sure that people feel empowered, um, that having a view when they're well about how they would like to be treated when they're unwell is going to be paid attention to. I think that's very important. Dr Crichton. There are some examples of good practice in this area. Um, those uh, patients who are uh, within forensic mental health services are subject to the care program approach. And we are rolling out um, innovations in the care program approach to make it more uh, patient-centered. But within that process of regular review, the advanced statement is revisited on a periodic basis. And then that information is shared with primary care uh, and other forums, and also on to electronic databases and those health boards which are, uh, uh, have these things um, up and running and accessible to um, uh, on-call and uh, emergency services. So I think that um, you know, we can make the advanced statements work uh, a, a lot better. Um, that, of course, works for the severe and enduring, those subject to... Um, practices like the care programme approach or equivalents, I think it becomes more problematic with um, uh, less serious uh, conditions. Okay. Karen Campbell and then Derek Barnum. Okay. Um, I just... I, to, to go back to your question was, should advocacy be um, have a role to play with advanced statements? And I think, I think we think they should... Uh, there, there's clearly something that advocacy could pick up on there. But I think for, uh, on, from another point, and this is on the point of the, being um, based in the Highland myself, that the Highland user group is a very uh, proactive user group and they have spent a lot of time with their members and from even before, as the Act came into force in, in 2003 and then implemented in 2005, they did a lot of work with their members 
uh, about advanced statements. So I, I don't know how, you know, if it's re been reduced, if there's less uptake now than it was then, but I know that um, it, had, it was viewed as a very positive thing, especially for people who had severe and enduring mental illness uh, and who required treatment, um, you know, more than on more than one occasion. So it's something maybe, uh, again, that, you know, youth groups could become involved with, um, you know, because they would be able to, you know, support members to, to do the advanced statements and, and understand the benefit of having that. David Mark. Um, I, I, I agree with that entirely. The, the, I was here when the member of the third sector said that people don't believe that uh, their statements are going to be listened to. That doesn't make it evidence. That was one person's view or a few people's view, and I'm not sure that's entirely accurate. If we take the Highland User Group, for example, their previous chair stood at a conference and actively promoted the use of advanced statements and said the really good things, but I don't have one. He actively chose not to have one. And people are, we must retain that right. But I'll just come back to Dr Gillis's point about the Mental Welfare Commission. We send advanced statements to the Commission, who are the protectors of human rights. If, in a board, we do not follow what is in someone's advanced statements, we have a duty to inform the Commission, and then the Commission will look into it specifically. So they're there, and it goes to them as a protective factor, right? because they are the protector of human rights. And there will be occasions where we don't follow an advanced statement, and we have to answer for that. And that's the purpose of it. Colin Fraser. I would just like to reiterate the point that, that, that I think um, rather than um, recognising the low uptake of, of uh, advanced statements and organising around that, the priority should be to actually ensure the increased uptake of the, the facility for using advanced statements. I think it's a really important part of the legislation. I think it's really unfortunate that the, the, the uh, making use of that availability has been so poor. And, and I think it's, it would be really interesting research, actually, to try and get behind why so few people make use of advanced statements. And, and, and I agree with Derek. I mean, they, they, um, they, it's, it's voluntary, and nobody's forcing people to use advanced statements. But it's striking how low the numbers are and, and I do think it's something that requires attention to at least know why. Richard Simpson. Mr. Fraser has <coughs> actually made partly made the point I was wanting to make. Do we know if there's any research on whether this is a myth that advanced statements are not followed? Because the protective mechanism was written into the original act. You know, the purpose was that if it had an advanced statement, the MWC knew about it and then could de determine whether the treatment you received was in conformity with your advanced statement, and if it wasn't, why not? So, you know, it, it's disappointing to hear that, the, that there is some view out there that these are not actually worth the paper they're written on. So it would be interesting maybe to go back to the MWC and say, has this been properly analysed? You know, how often has it been a problem? The other thing is, uh, Convener, you raised the question of advocacy, and if I could just move that on a bit. At the moment, there's a a qualified right to independent advocacy, if practical. I think it says, if practicable. And that one of the questions I think has been raised is, should it not be an absolute right to have independent advocacy? Uh, and that might help us in terms of the advanced statement issue as well. So I wonder if, if, if our witnesses have any comments on that, whether it should be a right rather than if practicable. A much firmer statement in the law. Anyone? Beth, thank you. I mean, certainly I think we, we are aware um, that there have been issues with, with available, availability of advocacy services at, at, across the piece. Um, I think uh, across Scotland, um, a number of reports now have indicated that provision, provision um, can be patchy. Um, I think, however, in taking a decision to, to move to legislation and, and go down a legislative route to, to try and solve that problem, I think we have to be very careful and be very clear um, that additional duties will, will actually solve that problem. Um, I think first we need to get a better understanding of what the issues are and what are leading to um, these problems and I'm, I'm, I'm just not sure that, that we quite have that as yet. Um, so I suppose it's a, a question back around do we have a good understanding of, of what's happening here. Dr. Stokes. 
Is the issue not more about um, making sure that local authorities and health boards um, fund the provision of advocacy services? Um, I, I think it seems to be well recognised that provision is patchy, but um, again, in some areas it seems to work very well. Um, we gave a response um, in relation to the written response in relation to this as well. Um, and I have to confess that that's based on um, knowledge I have from my clinical job, which is as a clinical psychologist working in Greater Glasgow and Clyde. Um, but the example we have is um, of an advocacy service which is fully funded by the health board. Um, I'm not sure if there's a contribution from the local authority as well, but the advoca advocates are very embedded in the work um, of the health services um, and every um, patient within the forensic services where I work has access to an advocate. Um, but the advocates also um, become a part of the, the, the culture, the environment. So they learn about how mental health services work and they get to know the professionals that they'll be sitting beside at um, care programme approach meetings. Um, and, you know, with that, uh, in those circumstances, it's much easier to advocate for someone. Um, so I think there are probably many other examples of good practice across the country that we could learn from. But it seems to me that the key point is about making sure that the financing is there to be able to employ advocates. Beth, do you want to come back to that? Yeah, maybe just to agree with those points um, and add to it a little bit in terms of... Um, work that local authorities are having to do, it's actually a duty under the Self-Directed Support um, Act to look at um, the marketplace of, of services within their area and think about how they can develop that to make sure it's, it's sufficient to meet need. Um, and that includes looking at um, funding those, those types of services and um, looking at the balance between resource that is invested in direct service provision to the individual, if you like, through through self, things like self-directed support and, and personal budgets, um, and then also still having some resource available to um, fund, sometimes you'd call them universal services or, or specialist um, advocacy provision. So I think I would agree that there there is a, an issue about funding there, um, but I think that begs some, some bigger questions that I'm just not sure would be solved by, by creating a, a stronger duty. Dr Crichton. Advocacy has um, exceeded expectations and uh, in those areas which um, have well-resourced advocacy, they very much become part of the mix that promote um, uh, patient welfare and patient rights and uh, if we are a little bit disappointed in the take up of advanced statements we're not disappointed in the in the use of advocacy where it's available uh, as for strengthening in it um, uh, I guess I would uh, want to see uh, the evidence of those areas which struggle to provide it Mr Barton I, I agree that Sorry, I forgot your name. Beth, yes. I'm getting old. Um, about, I'm not sure of the advantage of putting it into legislation. Um, and I would rather take the approach of, so where are the people struggling just now, or what areas are struggling, and address that rather than taking a blanket, we're going to put it into the legislation. We don't struggle. We've got advocacy, including in dementia units, um, because we approach it as a right uh, and a responsibility to that. So I'm just not clear what the advantage would be in, Surely there, be, there must be an advantage, otherwise you wouldn't be doing it. Okay, I think that one has been well aired. Uh, is there any other questions from committee members? I'm just trying to get the committee members there, John. Oh, but sorry, you're, right, you're, yes, you're, you're fine. Yeah. You're fine. <laughs> Um, did you want to come back on that, Dr. Gillis? No, it's another, another point. It's another subject. Right, that's okay. Uh, because I, I was just about to, to to do that because we're probably in, the, you know, the last 25 minutes of this session, uh, and I know that uh, Beth Hall and indeed uh, Derek Barden have mentioned issues that that they would hope to get to or 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 or, or raise. So. Um, giving you that opportunity now about some of the areas 
that, have, uh, that are of particular concern to you, that if you want to place those on record, that would be helpful to us all. And if they stimulate another bit of debate, that all the better for it. Um, you know, so I'm, uh, Beth, you said you were going to come back onto some some issues. So I'll, I'll, I'll give you the floor and 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 accept bids from our panel members, just about areas that they feel that haven't been aired yet, uh, but they would they would want to say something about. Okay, um, <clears throat> I think. Just trying to be brief, it was maybe two additional points that relate to the, the first point I was making around um, the MHO reports being triggered in a broader range of circumstances. So it was to draw the committee's attention to um, sections 41 and 26 of the bill as well, which relate to section 41 relates to um, compulsion orders and compulsion and um, retention orders and section 26 to um, transfer for treatment directions, which we touched on. So I suppose it's a general, <clears throat> a general point about the need to consider those resource implications. And I'd, I'd be happy to provide um, further detail in writing at a later point, if that would that, be a better, be, a better be use useful. of time. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, the, the final um, other point was around um, welcoming the extension of the victim notification scheme. Um, but I think certainly many of our members had expressed some concerns um, about what, what then happens as a, a result of that, um, potentially making offenders who have, for example, learning dis disabilities, and um, placing them in, in quite a vulnerable situation. So there would be a need to consider um, what additional um, measures you would want to, to wrap around that in those circumstances. Um, and my, my colleagues from the professions may want to, to say more about that. Um, but I think those were the, the key things and happy to provide further detail, as yeah. mentioned. You know, three three good points in important areas, and you know, if, if any of the other panel members wish to <coughs> to say anything about that contribution, then please do, Dr. Crichton. Um, I should perhaps have uh, declared at the beginning I'm chairing uh, a Scottish government uh, sponsored group on the implementation of the uh, victim notification scheme, and uh, we're at a, a, an early stage of uh, deliberation, um, but uh, I, I think that um, things to ponder would be that, of course, we've been involved with victim liaison uh, for some time. This isn't new, but a certain provision, for example, the participation of victims at shrieval tribunals has been uh, rather haphazard and patchy, depending on whether people happen to know that they had the right to uh, go to the tribunal and ask to be an interested uh, person. So uh, I think that uh, there's an opportunity for um, uh, making a much more sensible provision uh, for victims. I think that the uh, discussions that we're having at the minute to concentrate first on restricted patients is uh, the right initial focus and also to base victim notification scheme within um, a Scottish Government is probably the, the right um, uh, practical way forward, uh, uh, at least initially, in terms of um, uh, uh, um, getting it right for that particular group of individuals uh, and then seeing uh, um, whether um, extension is appropriate to other compulsion order cases. But using as our guide the uh, non-mental health victim notification scheme and, and pegging ourselves to that. Richard, you, did you want yes, to say something um, about the victim? No, just yes, in respect of the victim yeah. side of things, uh, that I've been... Um, just received a very recent communication from an organisation called the 100 Families Organisation. This is an organisation which deals with the, vi the victims of uh, families associated with the victims of homicide where mental disorder has been involved. And, uh, you know, I'm not sure if their figures are correct, but they're suggesting that there have been 137 um, homicides in Scotland over the last 10 years in which mental health issues have been involved. Um, and that this is a greater proportion of the total homicides in Scotland, some 15%, as opposed to 10% in England. And, and more concerning, there have been only two incident reviews out of those 137, whereas in England, 
there have been 321 reviews out of 576 homicides. Now, I just put that on the record because I think in terms of um, this section of the bill, the victim notification, that, you know, it's not, it's, it, the victim, the victim may not be around, it may be the families as well. So it, it, it's, I just raise the issue and ask if anyone has got any initial comments on, the, on these rather stark figures, because if they are valid, they are really very stark, a, a difference between Scotland and England in our apparent approach to this. Well, I'm very pleased that the uh, chair of 100 Families is part of the expert group and uh, contributing to that. I think the figures he's taken are from the National Confidential Inquiry into Homicides and Suicides, which is based in Manchester. And um, if you're a practitioner who is unfortunate enough to have a patient uh, who either kills somebody or commits suicide, you fill in a questionnaire which is sent to the National Confidential Inquiry. The, um, I'm, I'm pleased to say that um, the uh, apparent figure of 15% is largely because of our greater problem with substances. So they're including there people who may be in contact with alcohol and drug services in that. And if you burrow down into the data and look at the absolute rate, for example, of schizophrenia-associated homicide, we are exactly the same as England and Wales. It's exactly the same as England and Wales. And I think that's a really important message uh, uh, to get over in terms of that. In terms of victim notification, it, I think it's always been the case that close family relatives of um, uh, someone who's killed is considered a victim, sometimes referred to as a secondary victim. I think that's true of the current victim notification scheme under criminal justice and will be true under uh, these uh, uh, proposals as well. I think the, um, uh, the particular beef of 100 families is in the um, inquiries that are made following a tragedy and uh, we take a very different approach uh, uh, in Scotland compared to England. Um, and I think it's timely to have a discussion about whether we've got the balance right. Um, the uh, uh, new chief executive of the Mental Welfare Commission was speaking about this very topic at a Royal College meeting two weeks ago, um, and we were uh, discussing then whether the balance was right in terms of uh, uh, their published inquiries. And uh, I, I think 100 families have got uh, a point in saying that it would be timely to have a discussion uh, about the Mental Welfare Commission's role in uh, investigating these tragedies and also what they put in reports. Thanks for that. Is it on this uh, subject, uh, Derek? Yes, please. Um, I'm not sure of the mental welfare commission's role in relation to this, so that I think that's an aside. This is healthcare and problem in Scotland's role, and it's about scrutiny. And over the last couple of years, they've they've developed a very robust process where uh, incidents of suicide or homicide within mental health services must be uh, robustly reviewed and reported on, and we report to Healthcare Improvement Scotland in relation to that and to the commission. But we've got to remember the Commission's there to protect the human rights. Healthcare Improvement Scotland are there to scrutinise what the services have done, and they work together. So while 100 families may be saying that, and that may have been true 10 years ago, it's certainly not been true in the last couple of years where we are well scrutinised by Health Improvement Scotland and have to put reports and publish them on our board websites in relation to what's happened and the action plans and the follow-up actions. The other aspect of that is we've got fatal accident inquiries as well. So the procurator fiscal looks at what we've done and what's happened and then makes a decision along with the families based on whether we have a fatal accident inquiry as well as a board's inquiry. So I'm not sure what else has been required or being asked for on top of that. And having been through several of those, they are quite robust. That can be very helpful indeed. It really gives us a much better picture, I think, than the one I was getting, which was quite a, a narrow one. And, and it may be we should ask Health Improvement Scotland to give us some further information as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Dr. Gillis, Colin Fraser. Uh, thank you. It's, uh, it's on the same uh, victim notification issue. Um, our, our members, when we consulted with them, welcomed uh, this, this proposal. 
Um, and certainly I can think of several instances over the years where uh, victims and families of victims have uh, been severely distressed when uh, a offenders have been released, whether or not they have mental health problems. Um, there, were, there were two other aspects uh, I just wanted to raise, uh, a con convener. Um, if one t looks at crimes which are short of uh, homicide or murder, um, there are people with mental uh, disorders whom one would hope to partially or completely rehabilitate following this sort of event. Um, and it, it would be important to ensure that the victims and families of victims were informed and that this proposal moved forward in a practical and practical way. Um, I think we also have to bear in mind that there are humanitarian aspects for the uh, person with the mental disorder as well, that they must be, uh, where, where treatment is available, it should be made available to them, uh, both from the humanitarian point of view, but also from the consequential point of view of avoiding uh, repetitions of these events when they're released. So I think there is a balance to be, to be struck here, which is actually quite a delicate one. Um, and I just wanted to raise that before the committee. Yeah. Colin, do you might went back in? Yes, I was just going to say that um, um, as chair of the MHO forum in Glasgow, um, I, I brought the proposals and the, the, the bill before the MHO forum. And this was the most hotly disputed subject. Um, people had strong views about resource implications behind the MHO role and what have you, but from an ethical point of view, this was the subject that caused people most difficulties, and it was the one subject on which I had to take a, a show of hands as to what the position of the room actually felt. Um, and the show of hands came down in favour of basically the broad view that if you're a victim, you're a victim, it doesn't matter what route you, you, you've come down to get to that position. But the, the minority position, and it was a slight minority, was concerned that there should be made a more nuanced, if you like, um, stratified approach to different types of um, mentally disordered offender. And um, I think people could see maybe the point of um, transfer treatment directions, but there are real concerns for the vulnerability of people with mental health difficulties and the risk of them being exposed. Um, post-discharge and that that had to be recognised. But it was just to flag up that it was, from, ethically, it was the most contentious issue in all the proposals in the bill. It generated quite a lot of heat. Thanks for that. And thank you, Beth, for your raising that as one of your points. And I, I think we had um, a good discussion in that around, around the, the, the table here. Um, is there any other... Yes. Um, this is um, a different subject again. Yes, that's fine. Um, we've already spoken about um, the need to promote a biopsychosocial approach um, in mental health care um, and um, efforts to give greater attention to the broad range of therapies um, which service users would benefit from, of which, one, um, is, is, of which psychological therapies is one. Um, I've already mentioned that I think that the terminology could be looked at um, and spoken about the need for more detailed care plans, just as was mentioned in the McManus report, and also that we need to make better use of specialist expertise. Um, we've spoken about some of the ways of doing that. Um, I would like to, uh, to add that um, uh, the British Psychological Society would like to see the tribunals um, seeking reports from specialists more often, um, and also for future legislation to give consideration to extending the AMP role to other disciplines, um, psychologists being one, but also potentially nurses and occupational therapists, um, if that was considered appropriate. Um, and I'm thinking about cases where um, the primary treatment may not be strictly medical. For psychologists, that would be particularly in relation to people who suffer from learning disabilities or other cognitive problems, um, people who suffer from autistic spectrum disorders, and people who suffer from personality disorders. Um, and certainly there are many psychologists who have the expertise to be able to give the information um, that is required when people are to be considered for compulsory measures. Um, and I don't doubt that there are other professions who might feel that they also could provide a role in that respect. 
Um, we've spoken about the resource problems in relation to mental health officers, mm -hmm. but I think there are also resource problems in relation to psychiatry. Um, and I know that the extension of the excessive security tribunals is going to lead to additional burden on psychiatrists. So it may be that there is a real need to look at who else can mm -hmm. contribute to the um, function um, of compuls applying compulsory powers. Thanks for that. Dr Creighton? Uh, this, of course, was um, uh, a matter of great uh, discussion in England for the 2007 uh, Act there, and we see in England no more responsible medical officers but responsible clinicians. I think psychiatry had difficulty in articulating why we felt uncomfortable about that, because, of course, we wish to promote multidisciplinary working and expanding the role of our colleagues. And I think it's partly because sometimes we're uh, a, a bit uh, uh, shy of saying what uh, medical people bring to the table. I think the two things that medical people bring to the table in particular are uh, a tradition of, uh, of making a, a clear diagnosis. We're not the only professions to do that, but that's one thing we bring to the table. I think the other is our experience of non-consensual treatment, that we learn... Uh, usually, first of all, in the medical receiving bay or in the casualty department with usually an unconscious patient or someone who is clearly incapable of consenting to treatment. And then uh, we make sensible decisions accordingly. And I think those uh, two uh, professional backgrounds is something that a med medical perspective brings. I think there is a question of of equality of esteem in terms of um, uh, psychosocial uh, treatment and that contribution. But I wonder whether that can be um, addressed through um, uh, tribunals asking for appropriate evidence from colleagues. Uh, and I'm not particularly convinced that changing the complement of who makes uh, compulsory detention recommendations is what's required. Mr. Barr. Yeah, as I've, I've stated before, in nursing we are not in favour of this. At, at nine o'clock on a, a of an evening in Crosshouse Hospital, uh, the doctors toddle off home, and the nurses are the only people in terms of mental health. Sorry, uh, <laughs> sorry, A and E. The doctors are still there. In mental health, it's advanced nurse practitioners who are on during the night from nine o'clock to nine o'clock the next morning during the weekends. I am not against extending the nurses' role. The one thing they can't do is they can't diagnose and they can't detain under the Act. Nurses, the vast majority of nurses are not qualified, either mental health or LD nurses are qualified to make a diagnosis. In terms of being able to apply the Act, you must be able to have a diagnosis, make a diagnosis of what it is. So we'll reach a differential diagnosis of what is unbalanced, wrong with someone and, and treat. Those advanced nurse practitioners can also prescribe because they're non-medical prescribers. So again, it's not about not wishing to advance the role, it's about appropriateness. And so there is no um, support from within nursing, mental health or early disability to extend the AMP role to nurses. Anyone else? Yes, please, Can I just respond to um, two things? First of all, I don't see this as being about parity of esteem in terms of professions. Um, I just think that um, certainly psychologists could play a valuable role. And actually, this is about making sure that the patients get the best um, assessment um, and that uh, the best decisions are made um, based on a comprehensive understanding of their circumstances. And that in some cases, um, where the mainstay of treatment is a psychological one, Surely a psychologist is well-placed to be able to um, advise on that. Um, and I think um, the point that um, Dr Gillis made earlier um, applies here as well. You know, things are moving on. Um, and in the past where um, it may only have been psychiatrists or medical practitioners who were able to have certain experiences that um, gave them certain competences, Things are changing. Lots of psychologists now um, have experience of working with people who are detained um, and certainly have the competence to, um, to diagnose patients' mental disorder. Is there any other um, guest on the panel today who wishes to raise an issue that they feel 
that may not have been covered, Dr Crichton's one. Mr Barron, do you want back in on anything? No, we... I'm we, just trying to assess, and uh, Colin, Colin Fraser. Move on to that. Right, OK. Uh, quickly. Just a quick... Uh, and basically to Dr. So it's basically about a transition aspect of age-related. Uh, and people may be moving from a CAM service onto an adult service. And I'm just wondering, you know, what difficulties does that really present in the detention aspect in, in terms of the resourcing and facilities? Um, I think um, we've already mentioned that um, insufficient attention has been paid to um, the situation of uh, young people under um, mental health legislation. Yeah. Um, I'm not able to comment on the um, resource issues um, other than to say that, um, as was mentioned by my colleague um, in the previous evidence hearing, um, that educational psychologists are going to become less available given that um, the funding for their training has been stopped. Um, and um, we see that as being quite a serious problem in terms of um, young people's mental health because um, I think it was... Uh, most people would agree that it's important not to stigmatise young people too early and if their difficulties can be dealt with when they're at school by educational psychologists, it might prevent them having to move into formal adult mental health services. Um, so again, I think this is something that um, you know, hasn't been given enough attention to under the current revisions and um, needs to be addressed. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Give you a Right, th thanks. I think I've got Colin Fraser and Dr Crichton, uh, and then I'm going to bring it to a close. Colin. Um, forgive me if I'm a wee bit behind the curve on this, but I, I just wanted to raise an issue which I know is a concern for some of my colleagues, and this may have been addressed in previous hearings. It was the impression that the, the, the role of the, the potential role of a second doctor in applying for a compulsory treatment order that there'd be some kind of transfer of responsibility of arranging that to the local authority, uh, rather than, as it currently is, the RMO contacts GP. Um, that was something that the, my colleagues were quite concerned about. Now, you may have addressed this in previous hearings, and it may have been discussed, but I was wanting to know what the, the, the current thinking is or what the current position is. Because um, as it is, um, I think it's, it's often... Um, it can be quite challenging for con consultants to get GPs um, um, in certain circumstances and the idea that the responsibility for the MHO would be to, to, to deal with the GP is actually something that's quite difficult for us to anticipate but maybe the thinking's moved on on that issue and I'd, I'd, I'd welcome any comments on it. It's, it, it. I don't recall, I'm looking to mother committee members here, but I don't recall the issue being raised as yet. Is that correct? You have now raised it, Colin. So, <laughs> and and that, that, you, you know, that was your opportunity to raise issues that haven't been raised, and that offer us there to you all. Jo uh, Dr Crichton. Um, I just wanted to return to the length of Section 52. This is the remand assessment section for people uh, before the courts. And I just wanted to urge... I, th I think sometimes a bit of a shorthand is taken that it's the same as a short-term detention and we should be making our mind up about treatability criteria in the similar length of time. These can be very complex cases um, involving the most extreme of circumstances and the Section 52 uh, allows that period of inpatient assessment without a tre treatability um, uh, requirement. And it's the strong consensus of, of uh, college members that sometimes we need a bit longer before nailing our colours to the mast and saying that somebody fulfils uh, treatability criteria. I'm, uh, I was involved in one case before the uh, Court of Criminal Appeal this year, and I have one coming up next year, both of which may have gone down much uh, uh, less contentious routes had um, uh, that section 52 uh, been available and been available a little bit longer. Okay. Any response on any of the last two contributions? No? Can I thank you all for uh, your attendance here this morning, the evidence provided in written form and t uh, today. Uh, thank you. 
um, all for your valuable time and hopefully that uh, we'll be able to use your evidence effectively in our ultimate report. Thank you all very much for your attendance. We previously agreed that we're now going to private session. Thank you.